No slides. <coughs> Which um, can be good and bad. Uh, dangerous for Martin, so he, I'm, I'm actually going to give these to him right now, so he uh, <laughs> can enforce uh, my time limit, because I could just keep talking. Um, the reason why I have no slides is because we're just, um, this is like a wrap up of what we did this week before, like at, up until yesterday. Uh, so really no time to kind of prepare anything uh, official. I just wanted to go over what we did at a Hackfest that we held uh, this week prior to FOSDOM in uh, Brussels. Uh, before I get into that, just a quick background on me. Um, again, as Martin said, that there's a lot of, there are a lot of friendly faces in this crowd. Uh, people we've known for a while, uh, all the speakers here. But if you don't know me, um, I am Tom Rondo. I used to run the GNU Radio Project, uh, basically up until last year, uh, until when I moved to, uh, to DARPA. Uh, and then Ben took over for me uh, in that position. So I come from the, the open source world of software radio, ran that project for five and a half-ish years, uh, have been working on it since 2004. Uh, and basically I got into it, like uh, I started using Gini Radio because I wanted to do some cool stuff with the whole kind of radio thing was new. We were really kicking that off, trying to figure out like what we wanted to do with it, what it could do. Um, and I wasn't interested in simulation. I was interested in real over the air, real world experiments uh, with radio. And Gini Radio and the usurps were, were there. Um, they were new uh, and they needed a lot of work, but they were there and they gave us this kind of access. Um, so kind of from there, just understanding that it existed, I went to my first GNU Radio Hackfest in, it was maybe 2004, maybe 2005, I forget exactly when it was, uh, but it was over at, um, it was Matt Edis' like first office space uh, while he was kind of creating Edis Research. Uh, and that got me into the project. Um, that really got me into the community. It was a small one, it was only like six of us that were there. Um, but we did a lot of good work. Uh, Matt and I hacked on OFDM for, for a week, um, got a lot of cool stuff done. Well, you know, initial stuff proved, um, but it really did pull me into uh, what the project could be and what the project could be because of the people and the community behind it. So that really kind of brought me into it. So I've been pushing on these <clears throat> ever since. Uh, we've held a lot of GNU Radio Hack Fests. Um, before and while I was running the program, we used to do like maybe two or three a year uh, over the, the course of, of events. Um, past three years, we've actually tried to do it in Europe as well. Uh, last year we were in Berlin, the year before that, TU Delft uh, hosted us. Um, really good fun, and they really are meant to kind of expand our scope of who's out there who wants to contribute. So trying to push that model of of us finding people and people finding us uh, to do cool stuff. So, <clears throat> so that's what we've been attempting to, to do. Historically, when it was GNU Radio, when they were actually like GNU Radio Hackfests, um, we were focused on the project. We were focused on the guts of GNU Radio, trying to make it better, trying to introduce new application spaces, um, fix bugs. Um, I think one of our most successful one was, uh, I think we, we're, Tim's, Tim's here, I think we actually managed to hit Balmer peak uh, for most of that week, um, but it was, it was when we did the message passing system in GNU Radio. Like that was a week of just like serious code work and infrastructure work that is now a core part and a really important part of, uh, of how GNU Radio works. So really cool, but very project focused. Now at DARPA, and, and even before this, I started to think about, well, that's great. That is a good model for the, for the project to advance and to become interested, you know, more, more uh, capable, uh, more bug-free, all those things. That's great. Um, but, you know, you guys all know this. Software radio is a, it's, it's a niche, but because it's, it, it's got a lot of very special uh, knowledge required to get into it. Um, <clears throat> so to be able to code in GNU Radio, you needed to understand a lot of physics, a lot of math, and a lot of programming, and a lot of software development concepts, uh, networking, operating systems, all those things came into play to, to do something kind of impactful within the project. But that's just one aspect of the software radio world is developing a, a tool set like, like GNU Radio. 
More interesting, I think, to a lot of people is how do you use it for doing interesting stuff, right? Um, we want to have this as just a, a base. Maybe you got it back. <clears throat> as just a base of technology, and then we want to do really fun things with that technology. So that's what I'm trying to do now is we have, you know, GNU Radio is a pretty solid piece of work. There's still a lot left to do in there, and that's what, what Ben is focused on. Uh, but having that tool, and not only that tool, but all the tools that are kind of built around the software radio ecosystem are now ripe for us to do interesting stuff with it. And so that's what I was trying to do here. That's what I was interested in, in trying to push on here from my perspective now uh, at DARPA is how can we actually make use of these, this kind of incredible uh, base of technology um, to, to kind of answer interesting questions. So, <clears throat> All right, so we, at this particular ACFest, it was a three-day one, so it's fairly short for us. Usually it's like a week, but we just did three-day one. Uh, set up in the hotel uh, here. Um, here's our website. We're, we're hoping to do more of these. Uh, we're hoping to continue to in increase the scope of them. Uh, this is just kind of our kickoff one. Uh, the focus of this was electromagnetic interference through incidental emissions. So kind of an interesting, almost obscure problem but it was kind of kicked off because the Federal Communications Commission, you know, the regulators, uh, the FCC, who regulate Spectrum in the U.S., their technical advisory committee came out, and I know a number of them uh, on there, they came out with this advisory notice that says these incidental emissions from our everyday electronics are actually starting to become a serious interference threat to the future of communications. So that's an interesting challenge posed, uh, an interesting thought to, 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 to look at. So we were like, what can we do using software radio, uh, kind of these you know, free tools and fairly inexpensive equipment, but advanced equipment <clears throat> to study this problem, to get a hold on, uh, on this problem. And it also gives us a chance to do some kind of interesting uh, work, interesting tools analysis, um, developing around that challenge problem. There's a lot that goes into that. So that's what you're we studying. Um, and then, the motivation for it, as I said, the, this threat to the kind of communications infrastructure comes because of, and I know it's a hated word, but it comes because of IoT. Um, you know, we may not like the word, but it's happening, right? Every, we are going more wireless. 5G, uh, if you're not into kind of the mobile uh, broadband world, fi fifth generation, you know, uh, post LTE uh, communications, huge topic in the regulatory business, uh, academics, and industry right now as we're pushing towards this. Uh, a part of fi fifth generation cellular communications is going to be device to device uh, and femto cells. So very small, um, small signals, small power uh, uh, radios trying to move a lot of our data around. They're much more susceptible, they're both susceptible to interference and as we've noticed here, if we're, if we, when we look at the results we got, the more electronics you have out there, the more electronic interference you're creating for yourself. So this is kind of this, this uh, field that could just start exacerbating itself and, and causing these problems. So that was kind of the motivation for looking at this. Um, two things, we, we really focused from the device concept uh, at our HackFest on, on two things. Uh, power supplies for computers and um, uh, uh, cell phone chargers. Um, so we noticed, so we, we, we did this collection and basically set up an, a set of experiments to, uh, to look at these different devices, um, plug them in, unplug them, like kind of go through different stages, capture snapshots of the data so we could look at it later. <clears throat> so we had like four cell phone, or four uh, um, laptop chargers, let's see where I am in time. So we had like four laptop chargers uh, that we were looking at. Um, we had an Apple, a Dell, a Lenovo, and then a fake knockoff Lenovo. And uh, you, can, you can almost go in order of what I just said to least emissions to most emissions. Um, that knockoff, uh, the fake Lenovo uh, power supply was incredibly loud. Like it was obvious uh, what was that, that it was just emitting. So we could actually have a standoff of the antenna and see the effects on the noise floor when that thing was turned on. So, Right there is a pretty good result that, yes, this stuff happens, this stuff is a problem. Um, I think maybe my most interesting result from the cell phone world was these little, you know, these wall warts, these little cell phone chargers, you know, direct AC to USB are also really loud. And because they're so small, there's very little shielding that anybody's trying to put into them. But you can see them. Um, what was the result? Who's, who's there? Like five feet away, you guys were seeing stuff? 
Um, so five feet at a standoff with just an uh, omnidirectional antenna, uh, and you can pick this stuff up. Uh, so that was really cool. <clears throat> The, so that what I think the experiment was, they had six of them, and so you, we have data uh, sets that are like you know zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six uh, devices plugged in. Um, so that's really interesting. And then there was one of those inductive chargers, the the Qi uh, inductive charge for the Samsung phone. You know, you put it on it. You know, incredibly useful. Like we all love the idea. You just want to be able to like plop your phone down and make sure it's like constantly charging with these uh, these um, well battery packs or. Uh, or otherwise, uh, probably the loudest of the group. Um, so they're supposed to be like near field, uh, you know, magnetic coupling. Uh, it turns out they're incredibly noisy. Um, so then you think about like, again, the future of our electronic and wireless world. Um, I believe, I don't know if it's actually happening, but I know I heard that there was discussions between furniture makers like Ikea and some of these inductive chargers to basically put them into your furniture, right? So now you're like, and it's great, it's a cool idea, I want it. Uh, where you just like put your phone down on your on the armrest of your chair and it's it's constantly charging, right? But the more we have out there, the louder the the the, the higher the noise floor gets. Um, and when you look at the data, this isn't just Gaussian noise, right? This isn't just going to central limit theorem, you know, uh, applies way way in the future. But it doesn't. These things aren't going to average out. They could actually, you know, they'll build on top of each other. So, really cool stuff from that perspective of uh, of what we were able to capture. Um, and again, we were just looking at snapshots. Um, uh, we, actually, uh, we brought in uh, a colleague of ours from Aachen who's actually studied this with, you know, he gave us a talk uh, on what they did, and they submitted results to the FCC uh, where he had like, you know, $100,000 spectrum analyzer. So highly tuned, very, very good receiver sensitivity, very, you know, all calibrated. Uh, swept the spectrum, like swept, uh, I think it was like three uh, gigahertz of spectrum. Um, and he, so you could see results in that perspective, but if you're just sweeping the spectrum, you know, that's one way of looking at the, the signals. From the SDR perspective, we just opened up our bandwidth, so we got 25 megahertz and a few 50 megahertz captures. So narrower than, than the three gigahertz, but instantaneous bandwidth. So now you can actually see in a, from a time perspective what's going on here. So, um, so some cool stuff from that, uh, that world. Um, and from, again, from that device perspective, that we could use these tools that we've been developing to study what is uh, potentially really interesting and impactful uh, problem in the future. So the, that leads us into the final section that I want to talk about. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to talk about the motivation because I think Ben's going to uh, talk about it more, is we collected a lot of data. Um, part of the intent of this was, like, if we're going to set up these experiments, if we're going to try to motivate this kind of concept, uh, we, wish, we want to be able to engage, like have the community engage with us uh, on this problem. So we want to give data. So we collected a lot of data. We want to put that, produce that data, push it out there. We have something like 300 gigabytes of data collected over like basically two days of these different experiments. Um, so then how do you actually transmit that data to people in a way that makes it useful for anybody here who wants to look at this, to study this, to take this further? Um, just raw binary dumps, we can do that. Usually you forget, you'll, you lose the notepad that you had that explained the, the experiment, and all of a sudden you have 300 gigabytes of data that you can't understand. We're trying to change that, so that was one of the big important contributions and um, uh, projects that was worked on this week at the Hackfest was defining a new way of, of embedding or keeping metadata information with the data. So there's this new format, basically a standard that we're going to try to push here from this Hackfest called the SIGMF uh, standard. Um, the data we collected is not yet in that format. It's in a, it's in an older GNU Radio centric metadata format. The intent is to actually convert that to this new SIGMF, uh, so signal metadata format, uh, um, file format that we can then transmit, uh, and so that you know. You can just read through that metadata file and it will tell you what's going on uh, inside of that data file. So the sample rates, the frequency it was collected at, hardware characteristics that we want to embed into this stuff, you know, date and time locations, a lot of information uh, um, that's going to be carried around here. Um, to me, this is hugely important for us taking it from from cool hacking and development work to proper actual science. So I think we can really bring science into our field by focusing on data uh, and the transmission and the communication of our data and our results to the wider community. Uh, so instead of saying like, hey, I did this thing over here and look at my cool results, yay, success, we can say, here's also the data 
come and help us prove it, uh, test our results, uh, repeat our experiments, um, and you know, publish against that. So I think we can really start bringing that kind of mentality into, uh, into what we do as a community. And, and to me, this is gonna be a hugely impactful result that we got from this week. Um, but I won't steal uh, Ben's thunder on that. Um, he's gonna um, cover that, I think, in, in more detail in his talk. <clears throat> So this is mostly, you know, I put this up here for a backdrop, uh, mostly because I'm actually pretty, pretty happy with our, uh, our little logo, Ellie, up there. Um, but no, so we do have this out. This explains uh, the problem book that we created for uh, the Brussels Hackfest and will be the, the space for our future work that we're doing. So the plan is, this is very tentative, but we are aiming for another US-based Hackfest in uh, November, probably in, actually not probably, it will be in California. Uh, and we're gonna be working with NASA Ames on that one. Um, so we'll be over there. Um, like I said, not, not fully planned what date it is, likely November, uh, and all the information as we release it will be available on uh, DARPAHackfest.com. Uh, so. so that's what I want to do, just introduce what we did this week, uh, give you a sense of what's, what we're going forward, why we're trying to do what we're doing, and uh, I'm going to end it there, uh, maybe a couple minutes for questions if, we, if anybody has any. Yes, Philip. Yeah, we, we do have time for questions, actually. Um, and I'd like to, oh, I'd like, um, I'd like to ask Ben to start setting up his uh, stuff while we're doing that, though. And Tom, uh, can you please repeat the questions? Because we only have one mic. And yeah, for those who want to leave, that's fine because this is exactly the time for that. Please, please try to support. Are, are there any questions for Tom? Philip. Hey, Tom. So, uh, how much did you look at the frequency? that the uh, missions were at? Is it mainly like low, lower frequencies, or is it getting up? Yeah, yep. So the question was, what frequencies did we look at? Um, and was it low frequencies or higher frequencies? We actually studied motor noise from a blender, uh, and for there we looked at low frequencies like like sub 20 megahertz for that one, because motor noise, you know, it's, it's related to how fast the motor's running. For the wall chargers and the, the power supplies, we looked at uh, 150 and 250 megahertz. So we didn't get really high up. We never really, and that was mostly based on the antennas that we had available to us. Um, but we did see stuff at the hundreds of megahertz level uh, that was pretty loud. So you are starting to get into uh, communications areas. Uh, exactly, right, thank you. So, he, he has to, so we are gonna get into bands that the IoT cares about, yes, thanks. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, metadata format. Does it also support uh, uh, geolocation? So the uh, the question was about the metadata format. If it supports geolocation, and yes, so longitude and latitude and GPS time is, are fields that are uh, that are specified in there. Uh, and Ben will, I think Ben will show you actually what all the fields that are in the metadata format that we're using. So, um, and also like this is like this is kind of version point one of the standard. Um, so we you know. We should engage in people who want to, uh, uh, if, if you see holes in it, that we should think about and add. Because this is new, so as we're socializing it, this is the right time to really lock down the main points of the metadata format. So. Can, can, can everyone, is there still an empty seat up there?